Yeah. It's the Craggy Rugby Podcast. I'm Rob Murphy. Connacht have lost by five points away to the Scarlets, who were chasing Champions Cup rugby and had more fire and want in the second half. That will go down in infamy for Connacht rugby from the studios of TG Car, where we commentated on a Monday night. And it's late on a Monday night, so we'll be sharp and swift with this podcast. Alan Deacon, welcome along. Hi, Rob. Yes, that's a perfect tone. William, do you want to just strike that exact second half tone? It was an absolute mess. Um, the defensive work in the first half at times wasn't great, but they were cruising at half time and came out in the second half and fell apart. Decision making, leadership, not enough want. They didn't want it enough. And what really is irritating is they got their little 10 minute phase in the Scarlets 22. One more score, I think that the deal's done, but they weren't accurate enough there and they weren't really switched on to what they were doing and you cannot talk that away it's, it doesn't matter that Connacht had nothing to play for or it was the last game of the Pro 14 last every game in the Pro 14 I think if we go Pro 16 next year there was so much to like about the attack in the first half but it'll be the dominating thought now is that Connacht there let themselves down so so brittle any challenge to the Anything said so far? Um, I don't know how it's still called the Pro 14 when there's only 12 teams in it this year, but <laughs> um, that's about the, that's about the level that Connacht are at tonight. Like we're just looking at replays here. We're still in the, in the first half replays. Yeah, first half replays and, this is so. Can we just stop it here? Yeah, because like, we were eulogised. I mean, like I just I can't get my head around this. Like it's it's ridiculous to 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 play the game like that. Really, to to set yourselves up. Uh, it is true to say that it felt like less than a 21 point game at a half time no question Connacht had how many tries I think three converted tries during Sindin yeah. so three converted tries and then two in the last couple of minutes of the, the half yeah. first time I've ever scored four tries over there five tries five tries sorry yeah first time I've ever scored five tries in Clenetley. Uh first time they've ever scored 30, more than 33 points over there and we still haven't won I've been scoring 36 points we scored 33 points there twice and still didn't manage to win so there's something about when we score a lot of points, they just score more than us. The defence was incredibly passive tonight. Throughout the match, first yeah. half, second half. Yeah, it was just passive. It was passive all night. It was it was a strange, strange way to play the game against a team who likes to run with the ball. Like it was a case of, well, let's see if you can run with it. Oh, you can. Like, <laughs> so why why keep that going? Like you know, yes, if you're going to give us space, Scarlett to go, and if you give us space, we're going to score tries, and and we just kept giving them space. Yeah, Jimmy Duffy yesterday when I asked him how the, you know he he basically said the, that's the way the Scarlets play. I don't think they Scarlets did nothing unusual tonight. Yeah. Um, they just ran a lot. They they like unstructured play, and they they um, they were able when they got every time they got in, they looked really dangerous. Connick's defence got narrow, and there was it didn't look as if they were completely trusting each other. But you still got to reflect that at halftime, Connacht were 21 points ahead in this game. And if you want to, you know, I don't, I don't know how they explain that. It's, it's, it's almost impossible. I know in modern rugby, you can get seven points very, very quickly. Connacht scored three points in the second half, a penalty. If you're a top four side, you don't lose a 21 point lead. Yeah. And you know what's worrying me about this season is our rate in eight and people are saying, look, we finished second, that's the second best finish in the history of this competition for Connacht does not feel in any way like the second best season. I'm not taking away from the fact it is a good, solid achievement to get to the Champions Cup. That is a credit to Andy Friend three years in a row and this management team and all the players. Uh, their away form, five wins from eight, is a fantastic away form. And when you add in two points tonight, the points return from away from home is outrageously good. But I'll start with you, Alan, and then William. Like, that's in the context of a season like no other for the amount of disruption to teams and the amount of times we play teams without their internationals. And that's in the context of a home record that was abysmal. And that's in the context of more than one or two big leads let slip even before this one. Well, I, I sort of break it down in, into the, the sort of, we have two levels of game that we play. We play the Interpros and then we play the rest. Mm. We won one Interpro. Mm. And that's, that's not good enough. You're going to be, if we're going to be competitive, we have to be able to. What, what Scarlet's did in the second half was that they raised their game. They went up as gear and Connacht weren't able to deal with that going up a gear. Ospreys did it against us at home. They went up a gear when they needed to. Munster did it when they were in 
in Connacht as well the better teams did it Le- Leinster weren't able to do it because they didn't have enough of their experienced players on the field in order to do it yeah. now had Niall Murray's offload to Kieran Marmion just William from the line because William was kind of touching on the point yeah. that they could have seen that I actually think you're you know that might sound daft in the collapse but at 33-31 we score there yeah. two scores ahead that could have broken them you're always going to get a chance yeah. and the fact is they had 10 minutes of chance and they just they didn't they didn't seize it. They they, they got a, a pitch inside the Scarlets twenty two, and you thought, okay, this is your chance. Get another score. Kick. Get a try. Get your conversion. Get seven more points on the board. Scarlets then have to chase the game again. They've got to go and try to win it for the second time. You might get another error, and then. But they didn't. They did, they just didn't seem, and that was unfortunate. I mean, he'll look at that. Niall Murray will say he'll get that right the next time. We're. we're Actually, we're looking at another one of his runs here, actually. Because we're getting the lead up to a try in the first half. First was half. Brilliant. There were so yeah, many tries great. in the first half. We're having the longest ever highlights of the first yeah. half that we've ever seen here. Yeah, that was the youngest team we've put out this season and one of the youngest teams we've ever put onto a field in a Pro 14 game. And even more so, the bench was even younger again. So the average age of the team was 25.2 or 25.3 and the bench was only 23.9. I think that's why I think if they scored air the enthusiasm of youth yeah. would then take them and, and bring yeah. them and would give them that that sort of oomph to get them going and, and say, yes, we can actually win this game and move on. And it is amazingly small margins. We're, we're very disappointed. We're very depressed. But at the same time, yeah, I think you score that try. We're, we're, we're within a ball being popped in the air from scoring a try to give us a win, I think, in that game. And then we've got a completely different conversation. It's a daft sport sometimes, rugby. Because, like, you know, God... My oh, a five point defeat with two bonus points that'll do nicely let's move on and instead we're just rattled because it's all about context rugby is always about context and the context of this is even with Alan's point about the young players that are out there there was plenty of experienced players out there as well and they just fell apart the problem is the, the momentum has stalled now they've lost three games in a row they've lost games differently every defeat has been slightly different um, they played really well in Thoman Park and just got beaten. They were doing really nicely against Edinburgh. They weren't tearing it up, but then Jared Butler got a red card and they nearly saw it out, but they didn't. Tonight, they're 21 points up at half time, and they still couldn't see it out. I will now bring up the issue of Schultz. Uh, that was a red card. Yeah. If you're following the edicts that have given red cards to Jared Butler and Bundyaki in different contexts, one for Connacht, one for Ireland. The TMO, who's looking at the same pictures as us, said to the referee, it was an open palm and it hit his chest. Well, just to be clear, he's, he said open palm and what you're saying is you're referring to his elbow because uh, they were talking about his elbow, but they also said the open palm as well just for some sort of mitigation, I don't know, because he was an attempted handoff. And then he said the elbow hit his chest. Hit his chest. Uh, the elbow didn't hit his chest. It hit uh, Torch's chin. <laughs> chin would be correct. Bang. And that, if you're sticking to the law, is a red card. And my frustration is that that decision is made off the field by somebody looking at a screen who, in my view, has got it wrong. And the difficulty is, if the referees don't have access to good pictures, now there is a screen at the Scarlets, there could be a screen on the touchline for him to go and look at, which is really what's coming. That's yeah, going to be the solution. Much better pictures. Alan was pointing out as a really bad big screen at the Scarlets. Yeah. yeah, but what you do is you, you provide it. I'm not saying that costs Connacht the game. And the point is... Uh, as well as Connacht, you know, whether or not it costs Connacht the game or whether we need to whinge about it too much, Cardiff have a lot of legitimacy if they're complaining about that because that's the difference between them getting to the Champions Cup and not uh, automatically and finishing third, perhaps. Look, I mean, over the course of the season, these things even themselves out, yada, yada. But this, these are important decisions. Cardiff's Champions Cup was on line there and the referee got it wrong. Yeah, very much so. Very much so. And, uh, and it's, it's very frustrating that, that, you know, as Connacht fans... You know, we're told that, ah, you guys are you always complaining. You know, we're looking at Jared Butler's decision. You know, there, there was a couple of other yeah, elbows to the face in that game against Edinburgh. Yeah, Jared Butler's the only one that the team all comes back on. And you're sort of going, well, why? Why does it seem that that you know maybe we're maybe there is a bit from 
fed up and I'm tired and it's late at night. But yeah, well, it's, I think, it's it's still, I think the know, point is it, the systems aren't working consistently and ergo then they're going to work erratically and erratic is not good for any competition and that's erratic refereeing what we saw there this evening. Yeah, and it goes back to, because uh, I still remember the first time we, we played in Montpellier and we went down there and after 20 minutes I remember turning to whoever was beside me, I think it was Eugene Stewart, and saying, this ref doesn't realise we're Connacht. He's reffing this as though we're just another team because the 50-50s were going either side depending on which way it went. And it's like, wow, I wish we had more referees like that. And, and, and this season, it seems to have flipped back to, well, it's only Connacht, it's OK. I think that was two... Well, when was that? About 2006, I think. Yeah, something like that. Wow, long time ago. OK, here's some uh, audio so we can take a breath. No one's going to be able to look away from the fact that Connacht led by 21 points at half time. So that's a really disappointing way to lose a game. Yeah, totally. You know, like we said at half time, good, good, good first forty. Some things to be happy with, but um, guess what's happening in the other shed? The other shed, they're about to get a ball again because they're playing for their Champions Cup, and we know what's coming. They, they actually are very good in the, the second, the first twenty minutes of the second half, and we're going to have to handle the pressure. So we talked about it, um, but we didn't do it. I thought our discipline was poor. I thought our our accuracy around the tackle, around the ruck, was poor. And with every score that they got, you could just see confidence and momentum building from the from the Scarlet's point of view, and, and ours dropping. So uh, it was a very disappointing second half. Even in the first half, they had two tries, had a third try, obviously taken off for a, a yellow card. But every time they got into the twenty-two throughout the whole game, Connick never really looked capable of kind of stalling them. Yeah, I, I thought our D on the you know, the whole the whole game was poor, and we said actually at half time, listen. We scored 33 points, but let's not kid ourselves. We've actually played against 14 men for a majority of it. So um, the space won't be there in the second half, fellas, because they're not going to get two more yellow cards. Uh, so I thought possibly the scoreline flattered us a touch at half time. Um, we knew what was coming, mate, but um, yeah, they were better than us. You know, I mean, there's no question no one's going to remember this if you go to Leicester and win. But at the same time, it really feels like, even though these games didn't mean a huge amount for Connick's uh, ambitions in terms of the Champions Cup, they've left a kind of a bit of a scar. Yeah, they actually, 100% they have. And, I mean, and, and it's not fair to say they didn't mean anything to us. They did mean something to us. And we went into these games wanting to win these games of rugby. So we've let, you know, a, a, a lead slip against Edinburgh. They score after the bell. That, that was heartbreaking, and now we've let a massive lead slip here. So um, the way we're finishing games at the moment is nowhere near acceptable. It's something we've got to get much, much better at. In terms of the difference between what you planned and what pans out on the pitch, what's your feeling about like the communication or what you feel is going wrong uh, in these kind of contests where you know that is not the picture that you had in your mind going into the contest? Yeah, I, I think um, well, a little bit different. Today, uh, you know, I thought it was our game control in the Edinburgh game. That's what let us down. It was it was more our, our discipline and our work rate and connect and our connection and defence in this game. We couldn't really get the footy in the second half, as you saw, um, because a set of ill discipline and and uh, and some pretty sloppy D. So uh, we managed to find a different way to lose this one. Um, but again, it's you know they're learns for us, and we've got to make sure we're we're taking those and make sure we don't see the same thing happen next time. Uh, Paul, uh, you have a flight to get back soon, so we won't keep you too long, but you're listening to your own head coach there, just being really, really critical of the way you play. Do you kind of understand where he's coming from? Yeah, 100%. Um, I suppose we were probably a little bit too relaxed, is what I put it down to. And that, that obviously helps in attacking. You can see that in the first half. You're relaxed, you're throwing that pass, but it's not. it doesn't help your D. Um, we didn't put up enough fight um, in our own 22. Uh, we slipped off too many tackles, so no, I'd have to agree with Fendi, and it wasn't it wasn't good enough. Yeah, because I'm I'm loath to spend too much time like eulogising the tries, but at the same time, at half time in our commentary, you you were getting nothing but praise from us for some fantastic attacking rugby. So that's like a lot of the good work's undone now, isn't it? Yeah, well, our, our line out strikes in the first half were really good, and then we didn't any mm. we didn't get any in the second half. Um, we just couldn't swing the momentum back in our favour, and um, yeah, it was it was just one of those games that slipped away and. Um, even though, yeah, technically it doesn't mean anything for the league, it's still really, really disappointing. 
when it was starting to get away for you, what were you trying to say? Were there any elements that you, you're frustrated with now that you kind of said as a group you wanted to get right after, let's say, they got the second or, or second or even the third try to get within two points? Yeah, we, we spoke about holding on to the ball or getting the ball and holding on to it and, and playing our game. But we couldn't get the ball. I couldn't keep it. It just between discipline and a couple of errors, we just kept giving them the ball back. And, and then when, when they were attacking, our, our defence wasn't good enough. These next two weeks, what are they going to be like, Paul, to get, get yourselves right for Leicester? Because you probably have to find something that isn't there at the moment. Yeah, they're, they're going to be massive. We have a couple of days off now, but when we come back in training, we're going to have to come back in flying. And I suppose Leicester's going to be a great challenge going to Welford Road, with or without the crowd. And it's, it, it, it's, it's a massive game for us. We, we've spoken this week about trying to get silverware and... Um, the first step of that is in two weeks' time and our training over the next couple of weeks will be really good. OK, to finish this, it's a Monday night, we've got to be somewhere. Listen, the main point is you want a nice round table chat like we do when we take a breath and um, when there's a, a free weekend. This coming weekend, we're going to have a round table chat to wrap up the season, the Pro 14 part of the season, as Alan's going to point out. And then we'll have our usual brilliantly produced uh, pre-game show with Alan at the helm on the following week sometime out of the Leicester yeah. game. And we're back on track. Can I say something at this stage, William? This Leicester game is critical for me. It's critical somewhere if not now when are they going to win in England and so much has gone wrong in the last 72 hours towards you know my own ambitions for what kind of can achieve because Bundyaki's got a red card the whole team has put out a second half stinker there if we're being really really harsh but they're going to call that themselves so I think it's fair it's not the good way to go into it it's a one-off game really I mean it's a knockout game so it's different to any game that's been played in, in a league or a conference scenario uh, it was always going to be very difficult and they're now going to be missing their captain, Gerard Butler their talisman player, Bundyaki we don't know that yet but chances are he's you know a ban is going, is going to follow and the other person that they're really missing who I would love to see on the field that day is Quinn Roo but he's injured and that's what happens in rugby um, it's going to be tough. Connacht's record in England is appalling. appalling. Now, there have been some tight games uh, recently. So you wonder, is this an opportunity for them? Leicester are in a funny position. We'll talk about this in a lot more yeah. detail. But, but I just feel tonight, at the starting point of our mind switching to that, this matters now. These last two games matter, I would argue, even though... Well, I, I think the last three games matter because the other worry is if you get into a tight game over there, you think, well, will they find a way to get it done? Yeah. If they get a bit of a lead, I don't think they'll be leading 33 <laughs> points to 12 at <laughs> Thank half God. Time. Well, that's a relief. <laughs> yeah, because, because frankly, we might oh, be no. able to take that. They, they'll just have to they just have to dust themselves down. But there are issues and the sort of errors in defence that, that, that cost them tonight. Leicester will be a more physical side. I'm not sure. They won't play the same game as the Scarlets. No. They will play a hard, tough, physical English Premiership game. Convert your chance when you get it. Um, it'll be cup rugby, because English play cup rugby week in, week out anyways, but it'll be pure cup rugby. But Alan, the thing is, when you look at what we saw there, it's just that sense that you know there's a kick in Connacht. You know that. We saw it in Toman Park. You know that's in them. But too many little doubts are creeping in now, I would imagine. I'm suggesting, I can't say that for certain, after these kind of performances. Without doubt, without doubt, and and you know the only thing is, maybe they'll go in with absolutely no pressure on them at all because they've now finished the season eight and eight. They've lost the last three games. They've lost the major, all the big games that they've needed to to do it. They've only won two games in England ever. They've never won a challenge or a, a they've never won a playoff game or a quarter final of any sort against an English team in England. The only quarter final game we ever did manage to win against the English team was at home against Harlequins but of course it was the second leg and we lost mm. the aggregate game Will Greenwood yes Will Greenwood was last second Gosh. try um, made all the difference um, so yeah the, the, you know just from a, a standard point of view it's very hard to be hopeful on the flip side we have up to the last two games we have been getting better and better and better and getting closer and closer to doing things and as I say tonight you wonder, one of the highlights they just showed there was the, the first try of the second half for Scarlet where a guy gets caught in the tackle almost exactly the way Moray did and the difference in pass was he just left the ball in the air while his support runner ran onto it. Whereas 
Niall Murray fired it at poor Kieran Marmion and he didn't do it and, and he had a great game though really. he, did, fact, my, he was excellent I'm not yeah. I'm, that's been over here no, no, I, no, I don't I want to be harsh on the line I, I want to take the brilliant. opportunity yeah, to pick yeah. out I want to pick him out from a positive point of view I'm not going to pick anyone else out because it's nearly crass to start doing it but just Murray was really really good so I'm encouraged by that but we can be encouraged by all these lads every lad who took to that field yeah pretty much every lad who took to that field has shown us stuff this season that's given us something to hope for but collectively the unit is the issue as we round this podcast up yeah, they're going to have to to really sit down and get their selection right for yeah. for Leicester. I think it's going to be absolutely key. Yeah. Um, you don't want to see a back three selection that we saw in Tormund Park, I guess. No. Um, and I think it'll be interesting to see who's the captain for that game. It'll be fascinating mm-hmm. to see who uh, starts at hooker. I think it'll be Dave Heffernan. I think he might be the captain, would be my suggestion. And... It's uh, the likes of Alton Delan coming back as well. Gavin Thornbury did okay tonight. Um, he looked a little bit tired when he came off. You didn't want him to even be on that plane. No, I, I didn't. I, 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 I think he's such a key man and I'm not sure why he had to play tonight. And, and I'm d- delighted. I hope he didn't get a knock. I hope he's just come off because they said it's time for him to come off. He, he is massive. And... I agree with with uh, I'm not sure whether yourself Rallan said I think it, it is almost a shot to nothing for them they're going to go over there Leicester are going to think oh yeah Connacht we've never played these guys before in a competitive game and yeah look we'll win and that might be their downfall they're they're trying to rebuild after a disastrous uh, Jordan Murphy era it was chaotic and we'll try to preview that next week and find out what was going on because that's a club that really has lost its space. Um, they were normally in the top four all the time. Now they're they're a bit below, but tonight is going to have to be examined and looked at and if some of the same failings are brought into that game, then they won't get a, a successful outcome. Well, we're going to be missing our captain. We're going to be missing our best standing captain who was Quinn Rue up to so, so far this season, and we're missing our talisman in Bundiaki. So a lot of other players, the likes of Kieran Marmion, and Jack Carty, are going to have to stand up. Uh, Alton Delan, as you say, the guys, Finley Bealham, who <laughs> was pretty obvious that Finley hadn't been with the Connick Con- Con- squad all week because he... I, that, I, that's I, probably I the worst I've ever seen I him. I was going to say, yeah. I think we can say the safety because he's at such a high standard, but he oh, was miles absolutely. off today. And, and, it's, and I, you know, it must have been brutal for him to go and train at Ireland, do everything he was doing with Ireland, and then suddenly get called in here because Jack Angel got a, a last-minute call. And that was huge tonight as well, losing someone like Jack Angel. It's, it's other guys that have to come in and step up. Um, and Paul Boyd, I can see, you know, so there are guys who can do it but we really have to we have to see them well done guys you've rounded this off good work at least there's a bigger picture you know they win against Leicester all is good but like the only thing I'm hoping for is no one noticed this was on a Monday night we might just maybe the rest of the rugby world maybe Leinster and Munster and Ulster weren't watching fingers crossed <laughs> not according to Twitter anyway. oh damn okay that's it thanks guys loose cut it loose Break out or nothing changes side